I'll never forget my grandfather's 80th birthday party last year. It was supposed to be a nice family gathering to celebrate the old man, but it turned into the most terrifying night of my life. I still have nightmares about what happened. It was early October and the party was at my aunt and uncle's house out in the country, about an hour outside of town. They have this big old farmhouse that's been in the family for generations, surrounded by acres of fields and woods. A nice enough setting for a little birthday shindig, or so I thought. I drove out there with my wife and our two kids, meeting up with my parents, brother Kyle and his wife, and a few cousins. Pretty much just the immediate family, maybe 15 of us tops. We grilled up some burgers, had some beers, gave grandpa his presents, and a birthday cake. Just a normal family thing, at least for the first couple hours. Around 8 p.m., right after the sun went down, things started getting weird. We were all hanging out on the back patio when all of a sudden Grandpa froze up. His eyes got all big and he started looking around frantically. You hear that? He said in this alarmed tone. We all went silent, but I didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. Just the typical nighttime wood sounds of crickets and critters. Hear what, Dad? My father asked with concern. Gramps didn't respond. He just kept nervously scanning the tree line at the edge of the backyard, straining to hear something. An uncomfortable silence fell over the whole group as we all stared at the old man, wondering what was going on. Then he snapped out of it. Eh, never mind, he muttered with a dismissive wave of his hand. I'm just an old man hearing things, I guess. We all sort of awkwardly laughed it off and got back to the party. But then maybe 20 minutes later, it happened again. Only this time more dramatic. Grandpa suddenly stood up from his chair, eyes darting back and forth toward the dark woods. Don't you hear that? He demanded, a panicked look on his wrinkled face. That sound, like a baby crying. Now I was starting to get creeped out. We all listened hard, but there was nothing but the normal nighttime noises. No baby, no crying sounds. I don't hear anything, Grandpa. I said trying to reassure him, but he wasn't having it. No, no, listen. He took a few steps toward the tree line, cupping one hand behind his ear like he was trying to locate the source of the noise. It's coming from out there. Can't you hear it? We all just looked at each other with worried expressions, staying silent to humor the old man. But there were no sounds of a baby, or any other strange noises for that matter. Just the regular hoot of an owl, leaves rustling in the light breeze. Dad, why don't you sit back down and relax? My mom urged, giving him a pat on the arm. There's no baby out there, I promise. But Grandpa was adamant. But I hear it. I hear it plain as day. Please, somebody has to go check on that poor child. He looked around desperately at each of us, fear and confusion etched on his age-worn face. I felt a knot forming in the pit of my stomach. Something wasn't right. That's when my cousin Jamie decided to take matters into his own hands. All right, Gramps. I'll go look around out there if it'll make you stop freaking out. Thank you, son. Thank you, said Grandpa, relief washing over him as Jamie headed off the patio and toward the woods with a flashlight. We waited in tense silence as Jamie disappeared into the tree line, the beam of his flashlight bouncing up and down through the branches. After a few minutes, he came strolling back out, shaking his head. Nothing out there except for some deer, Gramps. No babies, no people, nothing weird at all. You could see the color drain from Grandpa's face as the realization hit him that he was just hearing things. His hands began to tremble as his eyes welled up with tears. I suddenly felt overwhelming pity for the old man. Was this the start of some kind of dementia or mental decline? Oh God, I could have sworn. The crying, it was so real. He stammered, struggling to understand what was happening to his senses. It's okay, Gramps. We all get a little crazy sometimes, right? Jamie tried to laugh it off as he patted Grandpa on the back in reassurance. No big deal. Don't sweat it. But Grandpa didn't seem nearly as dismissive about the whole thing. He looked utterly horrified, like someone who had just realized their entire grasp on reality was slipping away. As he lowered himself back into his chair, I could see his hands shaking uncontrollably. Hey, maybe we should call it a night, my dad suggested. Dad's getting pretty tired, I think. The rest of us murmured in agreement as we started cleaning up the patio, wondering if this early stage of dementia was going to get worse. That's when all hell broke loose. Oh God! Oh no! 
Grandpa shrieked at the top of his lungs, causing everyone to jump in shock. He shot up from his chair, eyes bulging with a look of sheer terror I'll never forget. No, no, not him! Run! He screamed, seeming to stare straight through us. In a blind panic, Grandpa bolted off the patio and took off toward the woods at a sprint, far faster than any 80-year-old man should be able to move. My dad was the first to react. Dad, stop! Where are you going? He shouted as he took off running after the old man, the rest of us close behind. In the dim evening light, I could see Grandpa sprinting awkwardly through the grass in his tan slacks and dusty black loafers, his frail body pumping furiously as he made a beeline for the tree line. Just before he reached the wood's edge, there was a loud bang, a gunshot that made everyone hit the deck in terror. I'll never forget the blood-curdling scream that came next. It wasn't a scream of fear or panic. It was a death cry of pure, unimaginable agony. Something piercing and inhuman and soul-shattering that will haunt me until the day I die. I don't know what made me look up in that moment of blinding terror. But when I did, I saw Grandpa crumple to the ground just before the woods, his spindly legs collapsing beneath him as he crashed down in a lifeless heap, face first in the dirt. Grandpa! Somebody screamed in absolute horror, not sure if it was me or my dad. In an instant, the men in our family were scrambling to our feet, charging through the grass in blind desperation to get to the old man. When we reached him, the scene was worse than any nightmare I could ever imagine. Grandpa was sprawled out on his stomach in the dirt, a massive crimson stain quickly spreading out beneath his body. There was so much blood, just thick pools of it gushing out soaking the ground around him. He had been shot point blank. Call police. Oh God, somebody call 911. My mom was screaming incoherently at the top of her lungs while the rest of us just froze in shock, unable to process what our eyes were seeing. This wasn't real. It couldn't be. Not at a goddamn birthday party. I don't know how long we were all just standing there, paralyzed in abject terror, mouths agape, tears streaming down our faces panic and chaos swirling all around us like a sickening whirlwind. I'll never know if Grandpa was already dead or still clinging to life in those first few seconds. I couldn't look. I was too afraid to see. It felt like an eternity before the paramedics finally arrived, lights flashing as they raced up the long driveway. A few deputies' cruisers weren't far behind. As the EMTs rushed over with their equipment, the rest of us just seamlessly made way. Our bodies moving on autopilot, as our minds struggled to process the unfathomable scene. I remember one of the medics asking if anyone knew what happened, but we could only respond with hollow stares and mumbled shakes of the head. No one had any answers. The paramedics tried valiantly to revive Grandpa, ripping open his shirt and positioning the defibrillator pads on his bony chest. Clear, one of them yelled, as Grandpa's frail body convulsed from the electric shock. But it was no use. There were no signs of life, no way he could have survived that kind of traumatic injury. As they somberly draped the sheet over the old man's body, I felt my stomach lurch. This was really happening. That sweet, harmless old man whose 80th birthday we were celebrating, gunned down in cold blood right in front of our eyes. The image of him lying there in a pool of his own blood, so suddenly and violently ripped from this world. It's enough to shatter a person's soul. The rest of that night is mostly a blur. I remember talking to the deputies, trying, my best to explain what had happened from our vantage point. How Grandpa started hearing strange noises no one else could make out. How he suddenly took off running for no apparent reason right before being shot out of nowhere. Looking back, those poor officers must have thought we were all crazy. We didn't get many answers initially, just that the shooter appeared to be a hunter in full camouflage, concealed somewhere at the edge of the trees. He clearly mistook Grandpa for some kind of animal when he came barreling toward the woods. And well, you can connect the rest of those tragic dots. The fact that the hunter didn't call it in, and instead took off into the night like a coward, made the whole thing so much more maddening. The police searched the area that night and well into the next day, but never found any trace of the shooter. No footprints, no spent shell casings, nothing just a few sparse deer trails heading deep into the densely wooded area that bordered my aunt and uncle's property. It was like this person just vanished, like a ghost. 
my friend Belly and I decided to go grab some drinks at this little dive bar downtown that everyone raves about. We took an Uber there around 10 p.m. and started drinking and playing pool. After a couple hours and several drinks, last call hit at 2 a.m., and we paid our tab to head out. We were both pretty tipsy, but not like blackout drunk or anything. We walked out onto the street to try calling an Uber, but my phone was almost dead, and we were having issues getting one to come. That's when Belly was like, screw it, my apartment is only a few blocks away, let's just walk. Even though I was hesitant to walk that late at night after drinking, she insisted we'd be fine since it was a straight shot and a pretty safe area. So we start walking down the sidewalk, giggling and stumbling a little as drunk girls do. As we cross this one intersection, I noticed these two sketchy looking guys hanging out on the opposite corner. One of them said something to Belly but I couldn't make out what it was. She just flipped them off without breaking stride. Then one of the guys started following behind us, getting closer and closer. We picked up our pace but he did too. I looked behind me and he was full on walking after us now, starting to move faster. My heart felt like it was going to explode. Suddenly Belly turns around to face him. In a slurred voice she yells, What the F do you want dude? That's when he charged at her and shoved her full force into the street. I watched in horror as she went stumbling backwards, and then a car came speeding around the corner slamming right into her. The sound of the impact. The thud as her body bounced off the hood. It's burned into my brain. I'll never forget that sound as long as I live. Belly's limp body crashed to the ground as the car sped away. She was unconscious in a pool of blood. I was frozen in shock before the guy grabbed me and threw me to the ground. As I landed hard on the pavement, I saw him and his friend turn and run away after seeing what happened to Belly. I pulled out my phone with shaking hands and called cops, desperately crying out for an ambulance. Time seemed to move in slow motion as I heard the sirens wailing in the distance, praying they would get here in time to save Belly. The next few moments were a blur of flashing red and blue lights, paramedics rushing at us with a stretcher. I remember seeing Belly's motionless body being loaded into the ambulance after they worked on her for what felt like an eternity. I had to go with them to the hospital. At the hospital I told the cops everything that happened, about the two sketchy guys following us, and how one of them shoved Belly into the road before running off. I tried my best to describe what they looked like, but in the darkness and chaos of that night, their faces weren't very clear in my memory. The police said they'd look into it, but without better descriptions of the suspects, hard to find them. It was almost a week before Belly finally regained consciousness after her surgery. Seeing her lying in that hospital bed, needles and tubes going into her, I was so thankful she was still alive, but riddled with guilt over what happened. I kept replaying it all in my head. In the end, I was just so glad Belly made it out alive. I didn't want to keep rehashing that horrible night. I'm just so grateful my best friend is still here and on the road to recovery. It could have all ended so much worse though. Every time I see Belly's scars, I'm reminded how forever I'll be traumatized by the sights and sounds of that night she almost died. I really thought I was going to lose my best friend. While those two creeps got away with it, I try to focus on the fact that Belly survived against the odds. Hi, I'm Sophie, and another night shift at the pizza place I work at. Things had been pretty slow that evening, so when we got an order for delivery around 10 p.m., I figured it would be an easy way to make some extra cash and tips before closing up. The delivery address was for a house out in the country, which wasn't too unusual around these parts. It was about a 15 minute drive from the restaurant, taking me down some winding back roads I'd been on plenty of times before. No big deal. I punched the address into my GPS and headed out. It was drizzling rain, which put me in an even bigger hurry to just get this delivery done and get back. The roads were pretty deserted as I made my way through the dark country streets, surrounded by patches of dense trees and farmland. When I finally pulled up to the delivery address, it was one of those older, run-down looking farmhouses set back from the road. Pretty normal for out here, but the whole place just had this eerily dilapidated abandoned vibe under the gloomy night sky. I grabbed the pizza and headed up the creaky front steps, ringing the doorbell. No answer. I rang it again and knocked louder, starting to get annoyed at the idea of someone just not answering after I drove all the way out here. 
that's when I heard the sound that made my blood run cold. A distinct metallic click, like a gun being cocked from inside the house. I froze, realizing in that heart-stopping moment that this whole delivery had been a setup. The next thing I knew, the front door flew open and I was staring down the barrel of a shotgun. Wielding it was this haggard, scraggly guy who looked completely strung out on something. His eyes were bugged out of his skull, and he had this deranged look on his face. Get inside now, he screamed, waving the gun barrel in my face. I was so stunned and terrified that I just obeyed, walking slowly through the doorway with the pizza still in my hands. The inside of the house somehow looked even worse, like a crack house times ten. Filth and trash everywhere, holes punched in the walls, graffiti and stains all over. I tried not to puke from the rancid smell. The guy slammed the door behind us and started ranting and raving like a lunatic, keeping the shotgun aimed at me while he paced around babbling about the device and the signal and a bunch of delusional sounding garbage. I was able to gather that this psycho thought the radios or microchips inside the pizza delivery bags were being used to track people or read their minds or expose them to mind control signals or whatever insane paranoid conspiracy theories drug addicts come up with. He threatened to kill me at least a dozen times, getting more and more manic and unstable by the minute. At one point he stopped pacing and turned to the side for a second, still ranting but not directly pointing the gun at me for maybe the first time. That was when I saw my chance and just went for it, chucking the pizza straight at his face and then diving at his legs the second he flinched and was distracted. We went tumbling to the disgusting stained floor, the shotgun skittering across the room as we grappled, and I punched every inch of him that I could reach. I'm not sure how I gained the upper hand against a larger, crazed man with a gun. Maybe he was too high and out of it. Maybe the smells and squalor in that house sapped his strength. Either way, I ended up completely by chance pinning his arms down and gotten a few vicious strikes with my elbow that I think knocked him totally unconscious. I jumped up and grabbed the shotgun, then beat it out of that hellhole as fast as humanly possible, back to my car, and getting the hell out of there, before calling the police from a safe distance away. When they showed up and finally got that freak in custody, they said he was a local that had gone off his meds and become obsessively paranoid about the pizza chains using their delivery services to spy on people or poison them with chemicals, or broadcast mind control waves, or some wild delusional crap like that. A search of the property turned up stockpiles of guns and ammo, plus jugs of toxic chemicals and materials for making explosives, the ravings of a complete psychotic waiting to snap and take his paranoia to the next level. These days I stick to delivery app jobs where it's all online and mobile pay and I can verify the drop-off locations ahead of time. Never again will I get that reckless about just showing up to any random address an unstable person can use to lure someone over to their house. That night was enough of a wake-up call about the kinds of twisted, dangerous individuals that could be lurking out there in the world. I've learned my lesson, the hard way.